Hey folks, this is the second video in a series about rolling backup. And if you saw the first video in this series, then you'll know that we looked at some really simple patterns that you can play on just about any chord in 4-4 or 3-4, which allows you to play just about any bluegrass song. But assuming that you're comfortable with that material, we can now get a little bit more complicated and play a little bit more interesting backup. And by that, I really mean something just a little bit more complicated and just a little bit more interesting. If you can do what we did in the first lesson, then this isn't going to be a huge step for you. But as long as you're willing to put the time and effort into this, then every time we add a little bit more, you'll be that much more confident and that much more in control of your playing and your practicing. By the way, as always, all the tablature for this lesson and all of my lessons are available at patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. That's where I post all kinds of stuff that you can't find here on YouTube, including things like a bonus practice tip for this lesson. So you're gonna wanna check that out. Also, if you don't mind, just do me a huge favor and subscribe to this channel and like this video. That's actually one of the things that makes these videos possible. So if you do that, then I really appreciate it. Okay, so the patterns that we're gonna look at today are really similar to the patterns we looked at in the last lesson. In some cases, all we're doing is adding slides and hammer-ons to the exact same pattern. So let's start with G and we'll look at some of the mechanics of the things that we're adding to this pattern. And then we'll see how we can apply that to some of the other chords as well. Here's the pattern that we started with last time. And here's our new, more interesting version of the same pattern. You'll notice that we added one slide and one extra note to the pattern, but the most important thing for you to notice in this new pattern is that it's using the exact same roll pattern. We're not necessarily always hitting the exact same strings as the original pattern, but we're still doing a quarter note and two forward rolls for the first measure, and then a forward backward roll for the second measure. And that's gonna be a common theme with a lot of the patterns that we look at, is that even though we're adding new material to these patterns, in a lot of ways, they're really similar to the patterns we looked at before. So as far as the right hand is concerned, once you get comfortable with this, it's going to feel pretty much like you're playing the original pattern. All you have to do is account for the changes in the left hand. So let's look at what's different in the left hand. So the first thing that we have is the slide from two to five on the fourth string. And it happens pretty quickly. So let's just try playing that slide alone a couple times in a row. And just like in the last lesson, before we move on to the second measure, it's worth working on just the first measure isolated and repeat that a couple times. Okay, now we can look at the second measure. The only difference between this pattern and the one from the first lesson is that the seventh note of this measure is an E instead of a G, which might be confusing to you because the note E is not in the chord G. G is just G, B, D. So why would we have E? Well, this is a good time to bring up the fact that sometimes in music, we don't necessarily always play the notes in the chord while the chord is happening and we just call these non-chord tones. We don't really need to call them that from this point forward because it's just part of the language of bluegrass, but let's say you're playing jazz or classical music or really any other style of music, you're going to find these non-chord tones and they have a different effect. When I hear this one with the E going back to G, it just sounds kind of like a springboard effect that brings me back to my home base. That's really all you need to know at this point, so don't worry too much about it. Let's just play this pattern a couple times in a row. Now, if you haven't noticed already, when you put this entire pattern together, this is the real bluegrass language. This is stuff that Earl Scruggs and J.D. Crow and Sonny Osborne and all of our favorite banjo players really played all the time. That's just a tiny step up from what we did last time, and we're already playing the real bluegrass language. So just try playing this pattern in its entirety a couple times in a row. So from this point on, we really just have other alterations like these to all the other chords that we talked about in the last lesson. So then let's look at C, which again is a really similar pattern to the one we looked at in the last lesson. This pattern, again, uses a note that's not technically in the C chord, A, 
but it serves again as a springboard back to C, kind of like in the example we just looked at. So just try playing this pattern all together a few times in a row. Again, nothing too crazy. It's the same roll pattern, just adjusted for one note on one different string. But other than that, it's completely the same, but it actually has a different quality to it. Sounds pretty nice. And if you put the G and C pattern together, you can start to see how this is coming together to sound a little bit more like bluegrass. The pattern that we're gonna use for D is again, really similar to the one we looked at in the last lesson. It just includes another hammer on towards the end of the pattern like this. By now you should at least be familiar with the types of alterations that we're adding to these patterns. Even if you can't play them yet, that's totally fine. But let's just quickly go down the rest of these chords with the alterations. Okay, so not so bad, right? It's pretty much the same pattern, just a slight change, but it makes a huge difference. So just to see the full effect of these new patterns, let's run them through a couple chord progressions and see how well they flow into one another. And as far as those patterns go, that's pretty much it. It's kind of a plug and play situation. When you see a chord and need it for a certain amount of time, you're just gonna play that many measures of a pattern like this. These aren't the backup patterns, they just are backup patterns that work. So it's worth your time to really work on them. Think about the patterns from last week. If you're a person that practices on a regular basis, then you've had time to look at that material and practice it and use it. So you know that with this material, it's gonna be the same process. You just have to get used to the idea of adding in these new features. But here's the challenge. Because these patterns are pretty similar to the patterns we looked at before, and they're not that much harder to play, it can be really easy to get complacent and say, I'm sure I understand how that goes. I'm sure I can play that. I'm sure I'll use that when the time comes. But again, if you don't have the muscle memory, if you haven't practiced it, if you don't have the experience of using these patterns, then when it really counts, you're unlikely to be able to use them. So treat these as if you've never seen anything like it before and just practice them until it's second nature. And that investment of time is gonna pay off now, but it's gonna pay off even more later because once you get more comfortable with patterns like these, it gets easier and easier to add in new licks. But if you don't have that strong foundation, then every single time you learn something new, it's gonna be like you're starting from scratch. But now you might be asking, what about our patterns in three, four? Well, we can basically do the same thing to our existing 3-4 patterns and just add minor alterations. So here's our original pattern in G and then the new one with a small alteration.
And as you might have guessed, we're going to make similar alterations to the rest of the chords in 3-4 as well. So let's quickly go over those. And now let's look at a couple chord progressions in 3-4 using some of these patterns. So that's really all there is to it. You can use any of these patterns in any order that you like. You can use as much of them as you want. You can repeat them. You can put the first measure second and the second measure first. You can do a lot of different things. But here's the important thing. You have to do it. You can't just understand how to do it. You can't just understand what you're supposed to do, but you have to do it. And that starts by not being able to do it. At first, when you try to do something new, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to do it wrong. Then you're going to make a slight change and you're going to get a little bit closer to doing it right. And you're just going to repeat that process until you can play it correctly. And for me, that's the only thing that's ever worked is trying to do a little bit better every time that I do it. And if I do it a little bit every day, then it happens pretty quickly. So it's worth a shot. Okay, so that's all. I'm going to leave you to practice this now. And let me know if you have any questions and feel free to check out patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo and make sure to subscribe to this channel and like this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.